name is Juanita Benitez, and I'm 29 years old. I was the one that found him. I got home from work about one in the morning and I found him in the garage. No indication why he really did it. Uh, a couple days before, he had just got a promotion at his job. His son was about to come down from Missouri to come visit us. He was my, he's technically my stepdad, but he's been my dad since I was six until up to 16. Once I found him, my neighbor was a cop at the time and First thing I did was obviously run into my neighbor's house, pound on his door. But by the time the ambulance got there, they already said he was gone probably about an hour or so previous to when I got home from work. That was my mom's soulmate, so it crushed her. I felt a lot of guilt just because I had just gotten a fight with him that morning, like a bad fight, and that's how we ended things. So that was the last thing I remember with him. And then my brother, he was the man of the house now, and he tried to put on his poker face for all of us. I was 16, locked myself in my room, blasted music, zoned out, cut everybody out. My brother's been my best friend, talked to him every day. We don't miss any day when we talk to each other. A week prior, we had made plans to go to the art walk in Riverside. As I was at work and I texted my brother about the plans for the art walk in. He didn't respond, which is usually not like him. Text him an hour later, still nothing. So something in my gut just told me something wasn't right. So I ended up leaving work early, went straight to his house. His salt water, his salt water aquarium fish tank was on. He does not leave that on if he's not home. So I knew he was home. Um, so I pounded on his door, everything, nothing, no response. And actually his neighbor realized that his upside his upstairs um, window was unlocked so I gave his neighbor permission to go through the window and his neighbor went through the window and his face I already knew. My brother was literally my other half um, so in my way I didn't feel like me I didn't feel complete and I guess in a way we did everything together we talked every day he was the one that called you at 11:59 on the dot to wish you happy birthday and that was gone and my birthday was literally the next month after you did it. So I didn't want to go out on my birthday. I, I, it just wasn't the same. I quit my job. At this time, my kids were going to be one the next month. I was still there, but I wasn't really there. Like, I knew my kids felt that I wasn't me, and um, they feel it. Even though they weren't even one yet, they didn't talk, they didn't walk, they felt it. I turned off my phone, quit my job, turned off all social media. I just wanted to be by myself. It was probably really hard on my husband, but he dealt with me. I didn't eat. The following year, I actually got it covered up, and I have the suicide awareness tattoo on my wrist now, which is just the love and the hope. That same year, my cousin is actually the one who introduced me to the D.D. Hirsch Alive and Running for Suicide Prevention, and I really didn't want to go. I did not think I could do it. I didn't think I could handle it, but it meant a lot for her for me to do it, so I sucked it up, put my sunglasses on. We went to the walk and my sunglasses did not leave my face. There was people on stage sharing their stories, whether they were the ones surviving someone committing suicide or if they were the one that attempted it. And they were just up there in tears sharing their story and everybody's crying and I'm trying to put on my poker face because I'm the one that likes to cry in the closed rooms. They convinced me to go to the front and as much as they, they had really had to pull me because I didn't want to do it. They did a whole tribute dance for my brother and then and my stepdad. And that was just, I don't know, it, like, the sunglasses eventually came off. I was still crying, but they came off and it was just, you don't realize how many people actually go through it until you're actually in that, that situation. Um, I mean, obviously you hear about celebrities doing it, but people don't realize that normal people think about it or normal people lose people to suicide. Obviously the main pe reason why people don't go to their friends or family is because they're judged for it and they don't want that judgment. And that's the hard part of it. And to me, it wasn't really him and his mentality. I, I mean, obviously I can't speak for him, but he wasn't trying to end his life. I think it was more he wanted just to end the pain and the drama type of thing because there was a lot of drama with her. So I think that's what it was with him and he felt that 
if he talked to me or if he talked to my mom, that maybe it would bring us drama. And he was the person that kind of, I guess, kind of like me, he held his feelings in. He would cry behind closed doors and stuff like that. You're really not alone. If you're not comfortable talking to family or friends, there are options out there, whether it's the hotlines. If you're not comfortable on the phones, they do have the chat rooms. Um, they do have the group counseling, the support counseling, the one-on-one -on -one counseling. Like, there are options out there, whether you like music or you like to read or you comfortable talking to a complete stranger. But the thing is, when it comes to like the support groups and the hotlines and the phones, to me, these people aren't doing it just for their job. They, yes, people, they get paid for it, but some of the people are doing it voluntarily because they've either been through it or been that person. So these people actually get what you're going through and stuff. What I've learned with all this is it's usually people that don't talk about it are the ones that do it. Um, the ones that say, oh, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, and do it, are usually the ones that don't, are usually the ones that you need to notice that they do want the attention and they are kind of hinting to you to ask them what's going on or ask them. And it's okay to ask them. Uh, I do have a friend who lost his brother a couple years ago in a really bad car accident. And he was thinking about doing it and stuck him in my car and I drove him to Glendale to the D.D. Hirsch counseling and I waited there for him. Um, and, and I even told him, I go, well, what do you want to do? Like, how do you want to do it? Like you have, as much as it's scary to ask those questions, you need to ask those questions. And just, and if they're comfortable enough to tell you exactly how they're going to do it or where they're thinking of doing it, that's how you're able to prevent it as well. But talking about it makes it easier because in a way I feel like it'll help other people more comfortable. And it started when, with the first Alive and Running when I heard other people talking about it just seeing how brave they were up there. I, I still can't do that part of it. I've done the interviews, I've done the documentaries and stuff, but I still can't get myself at that walk to get on stage and talk about it, I can't. But talking about it does make it easier. Um, writing makes it easier and I still to this day blast music. A lot of people are scared to talk about or to bring it up or even just say the word suicide. And, but they, people, a lot of people need to understand that it is something really out there.